I still, yes, I still see the PowerPoint, but I still see it in, um, you're not in a slideshow view. <clears throat> Um, I'm still seeing you in, um, sorry.
Starlight. Well, then uh, I think we'll just go with that and we'll skip jumping over to the LMS since you, you have some issues there, you said. And we'll, I'll just run the straight presentation if that's okay. 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 Uh, just, uh, just let me know. I, I, I have it up and running. running. So if you so would like, like me like to, to play, just play, let me know, so when, let me know when. when. Jump over. Well, um, I think we've given everybody a couple minutes to get in the room, those that are going to show up. So how about if we just. Uh, Go ahead and uh, begin. Okay. Okay. We are rolling. Well, thank you for all your help, Matt. Thank you. No problem. Hello. My name is David McGann. I work at Duquesne School of Law, Duquesne University School of Law. I'm the Assistant Director of Technology. And today I'm presenting on baselining technology competencies to position students, faculty, and staff for success. This particular project that I'm going to share with you today was greatly uh, uh, aided by uh, some team members here at the School of Law, specifically Chris Driscoll and Dana Powers. The three of us uh, were the team to complete this. So thank you for attending. So let, let me begin. First, a little background about the uh, uh, presentation, the actual product that we produced. Uh, it's a technology competency mini video course and what we did with this course is we wanted to baseline the competencies of students, faculty, and staff and assure that they had the technical uh, capacity, facility, and knowledge to be effective in their uh, teaching and learning and so we collected what we thought were the key technology items that they needed to know and we produced short videos uh, that are accompanied by uh, very terse quizzes as a means of, again, bringing their competencies up and baselining uh, their abilities. So this is a little glimpse into the interface. Uh, the screen on the uh, furthest left is the main gateway screen. This is in a learning management system called Moodle. Uh, the second screen, labeled the lesson page, is uh, just one of the lessons. We kept it very simple. The lessons basically uh, have a title, some navigation elements, and it's mainly the video that we uh, play. That's our main means of educating our students, uh, whether they be faculty, staff, or, or regular law school students. And then the screen in the uh, upper right is a uh, screenshot of one of the questions. Uh, again, we have a terse quiz that follows every video in each lesson, and these quizzes are either true, false, or multiple choice. So uh, we were going to play just a little bit of a video to give you some insight into the video here, but I have uh, a, a backup plan here where we have a still image of, of one of the videos. Uh, and this particular video was on password creation and management. So I'm going to talk a little bit about an, analyzing the need. We uh, perceived a need in an ad hoc fashion, and then we uh, performed due diligence to fully understand who are the key stakeholders, who are the audiences, what are their particular, particular needs, and that will um, very much drive the design and, and development and deployment of, of what we produce. So 
we found that there were two unique audiences, the faculty and staff kind of grouped together, their needs uh, are akin, and then the students were somewhat separate. And the reason they're a little bit separate is the faculty and the staff typically have administrative rights. They're the ones creating content in various technologies. So we wanted to uh, put forth those important uh, bits of information for that audience where the students never see that admin face. So we produce a separate set of videos for the students that, uh, again, are specific to their unique needs. As far as uh, the next point, determining the lesson subjects, this was very important to us that we key in on those specific bits of information that we felt were the most relevant for our students, staff, and faculty. And we uh, ended up with a list of about 50 videos. And the way that we obtain this information is to go to the people that will use it, that will consume it. So we uh, personally asked and we sent emails out to our staff and faculty asking them, what are the types of technologies you feel are important for yourself and for your students to know? So we uh, took all that data in. In addition to that, we examined the systems. We uh, maintained uh, over 20 different uh, systems here at the Duquesne School of Law, as well as other ones that are maintained by the university at large. So we looked at all of those systems and thought, what are the key ones these students really need to, to understand? And that uh, was part of the criteria for defining the list. Then we thought about the chronology of a new student coming in. What do they need to know right away? Typically, how to connect to the wireless, some very practical things, how to use the, the printers and things of that nature. So we aggregated some of the lessons around that. And then we did some benchmarking out into the external environment to see what other universities were doing to develop competencies for their staff and student. So using all of that um, analysis, we were able to put together a, what we felt was a, a very solid list of technologies for our students and staff to learn. And then finally, collecting the data to inform the design, uh, we wanted to, to really focus in on the key points that we wanted students to learn. We have a little lesson in Excel and something in PowerPoint. We also have things in, in Microsoft Word. And as I'm sure all of you know, those are very deep subjects that could, you could spend hours or even days uh, learning all the nuances and features of these applications. We keyed in, again, through this analysis and, and survey and questioning on the key features that most people perhaps don't understand, but those features that would really help them in their academic work. In addition to that, uh, we use some benchmarking as well. So when we were designing the solution, we wanted it to be end user centric. So we focused on the end user, which is totally appropriate. We use the uh, curriculum design model, the ADDIE curriculum design model. And some of you might have picked up that my presentation is indeed based on that same model. When we were determining the content for each one of the lessons, each one of the videos, if you like, we wanted to, again, be very specific and narrow. And one of the reasons we wanted to do that is we wanted to keep the videos to a certain time uh, limit. And we set that time range from one to three minutes for each video. We wanted them to be very easy for the students and staff and faculty to consume. We felt if we kept the videos terse, there would be a higher uptick, uptick in consumption. So we kept it very simple. Kind of back again to considering that end user. And now we're going to take a look at some of the lessons that we actually ended up uh, putting forth. So there's about 50 of them here. We started, uh, as you can see at the top left, with getting started at Duquesne Law. Again, what are those new students going to need right away? We aggregated those particular lessons together. Then we go through systems, Microsoft Office, Again, keying on those specific applications that we knew the students would be using in their, in their coursework. Some basic tasks, more advanced tasks, and then some troubleshooting. You can see it's grouped logically. It takes into consideration the novice status of new students uh, coming into the program. And it progresses linearly from, more, uh, from simpler tasks to more challenging tasks. 
So we're going to move into talking about developing the course and some of the things that we did that we felt were very beneficial for us. First of all, we use standardization for, for the production, the efficiency, and, and consistency. I mentioned uh, my two uh, uh, very competent and uh, wonderful teammates, uh, Chris Driscoll and Dana Power, that the three of us work together. And so it was very important that we talked about how we were going to produce this material in advance so the end student experience wasn't uh, uneven with regards to length of video, type of content, uh, pace of narration, things of that. So we performed uh, some tests at the beginning and set up some templates that were very helpful to us. You can see in this PowerPoint template I have some uh, objects that I've uh, put in there and so when we each went to build our video we did a PowerPoint and we did narration over that and we used Camtasia and I'll get into that a little bit. But we all used this same PowerPoint background, the same aspect ratio, the same shadows on the content, type size, things like that. And that gave our, our videos a, a much more of a high polish and a professional look. Uh, also, when it came to producing the videos as well, we uh, tried to economize there also using a uh, front end intro video uh, uh, slides at the beginning that I produced that were consistent throughout. So doing some of the uh, uh, master slide work ended up being very, very helpful to us. We did not have to go back and, and redo anything from a consistency perspective. Uh, one of the areas of the course that, uh, or the project that went very, very well uh, has to deal with the project management. Anytime uh, you're producing a large-scale project that could take weeks or months and you have various people contributing, it's important to have some sound project management tools in place. Uh, again, my colleague Chris Driscoll was very instrumental. He set up a SharePoint site for us. And in that SharePoint site, and these screens I realize are illegible, but I'll mention a couple points. So what we did is we tracked everything in the SharePoint site. So we listed all of the video lessons, and then we assigned, uh, we divvied them up basically a third each. Uh, and in those tasks, we had developing uh, the script, uh, doing the video, writing the questions uh, for the quizzes, uploading this content into the learning management system. And at each of those key uh, milestones along the project, we use SharePoint to say whether the work was done or not done. And this was also the environment to not only track the work progress, but also to help us with our quality assurance measures as we uh, moved into that final stage. Also, we found that um, one thing we did, we were producing about 50 videos, so we produced one video, and then we all, all the team members sat around and watched it, critiqued it, talked about what we liked, things we might change. So we all came to consensus uh, and had a formal discussion about it prior to us kind of going off into our own offices and producing our own videos. And this helped a lot with the consistency. Uh, also, as a project manager, you have to be very vigilant about assuring the content moves forward. We all have uh, day jobs and are very busy with the regular work that our, our, our uh, uh, staff and faculty ask us to do. But these larger projects, they can kind of fall to, by the wayside unless you have somebody promoting them. So we would have periodic team meetings to talk about status. And then also, uh, I put on my kind of cheerleader hat a little bit and encourage the team members to keep going because you can get bogged down in these large projects and it's important to encourage all the team members to, to continue to uh, see the final end product. And SharePoint was a great tool for us for the project management. As far as developing the course, the videos themselves, the screen to the left some of you are probably familiar, that's a, a screen that shows Camtasia. So once we actually uh, took the uh, uh, PowerPoints, what we did this specifically is we would write a script, we would then design the PowerPoint and build the PowerPoint content. We would then uh, use Camtasia and PowerPoint and do the voiceover narration for the PowerPoint. 
than any post-production work in Camtasia we performed. And then what we did is instead of uploading the videos to the uh, LMS environment, we used a tool that we have, which is Panopto, which is a video uh, tape, taping uh, and, and playback system. It's all cloud-based. And then we used embed links in the LMS to draw in that video content from the Panopto environment. And that worked very well. And then the final uh, bit I would like to talk about as far as developing the course, a little recap on some of the three points I mentioned earlier. But then finally, we had to actually build the course in the learning management system. Uh, so what that required primarily was to write the questions. And then we took time to write if they got it correct or incorrect. We have substantive feedback regardless of, of how they answered it, because these quizzes uh, were, the primary reason for the quizzes were for formative assessment and for the students themselves to understand not, if they got it right, why it was right, and if they got it wrong, something to think about and they could go back and, and retake the quiz. So we spent a lot of time making sure that that assessment piece was um, on target but we also kept the questions very terse, uh, again, considering the end users and the time constraints they have. We wanted to make it uh, look easy to get through the content. So, And then again, in Moodle, what we did is, again, we did some unit testing, but we built one lesson in Moodle. We did one of the quizzes and the assessments in Moodle. We did some piloting and some quality control prior to rolling out those particular settings for the remaining 49 videos. Uh, a little bit on implementation. Uh, again, we did uh, some piloting. Once we finished, uh, we did some unit uh, testing. But then when we finished the entire program in the learning management system, we invited some students and other stakeholders to review or receive that feedback and then uh, we remediate it as is uh, needed. Uh, again, keeping with the ADI model of continual improvement. As far as the timing, we uh, will be rolling this out again uh, prior to the start of the fall semester, uh, a couple weeks out, so it's close enough that the students are interested, but far enough out so that the, the one else, the students are coming in, our new class, they'll have time to build these competencies before they show up for class on the first day. So timing was certainly something we were considerate of. Uh, as one of the issues we had that was a little challenging was fostering consumption. That is to get the students and the staff and faculty actually go out and look at the videos and use it. So we considered making it mandatory, but then we retracted from that for various uh, pragmatic reasons. Then we considered using badges, digital badges, and we abandoned that because we didn't feel that was sufficiently compelling for the students to engage. So we ended up focusing for the students on holding a contest, and we uh, advertised it well. And the first student that would completed all of the courses successfully received a uh, Duquesne University School of Law hoodie. And so that gentleman very much liked that. But it is an ongoing issue that we want to encourage people. We put a lot of work into this, and we fully understand the value. But they're busy people. They're busy students. So we're, we're always looking for ways to um, continue to encourage them to, to use the tool. I would note here also that a uh, quick note on the LMS. Originally, we built the, the entire uh, program in the Blackboard learning management environment. We felt that the environment was a little clunky, uh, and so we uh, rebuilt the entire thing in the Moodle platform, which was much cleaner, much more stripped down, and we'll be rolling out the Moodle version uh, this late summer to those new students that are coming in. We feel that that uh, kind of stripped down version will keep it kind of lean and clean, and again, we're focusing on end user needs and hoping to improve their uh, consumption of the tool. Uh, through that through that means. And then finally, I'd like to share with you just some um, lessons learned, basically. What really went well with a large-scale project like this was developing the templates and getting all of that consistency worked out in advance of the production phase of the project. 
having that one sample video for us all to talk about, kind of put up a straw man and poke holes in it, that was very helpful. It got us all thinking in the same mindset and we were able to produce the videos in a much more consistent manner. Uh, as far as quality insur assurance, unit testing, particularly on the, the quizzes and the reporting, the analytics, uh, that was very helpful. And then restricting uh, to narration only. We had considered using uh, the talking head live uh, motion, uh, full motion video of somebody talking, but that would have caused much more um, edits uh, during the uh, post-production phase, so we went with narration only. Something, a couple points here we would have changed. One is uh, we would uh, narrow the talent pool. Originally, we wanted the faculty and staff to actually narrate the videos, but the logistics of scheduling them was so problematic that Chris and Dana and I ended up doing the work ourselves. Uh, we would have likely used Moodle as the LMS from the onset since we had to do the presentation uh, the, course twice in two different LMSs. And then we might have taken a little more uh, time to explore some other software with regards to uh, the development and the um, deployment phase of the presentation. But we felt pretty good with our tools. But those are a few lessons learned that hopefully uh, those that are attending can take to heart if you choose to engage in such a project. So now I'm going to move to the Q&A phase, but we're having a little uh, uh, problems with the audio at our end, so I'm going to drop out of this and we'll use the um, WebEx environment and we can use the chat feature if that's okay, if there's any Q&A. And also, I realize it's towards the end of the presentation, so thank you all so much for joining me in this presentation. Uh, I wish I could be there in person to, to see you and answer your questions and talk with you further. Worth a shot. <laughs> you can find me at the Duquesne uh, School of Law here in Pittsburgh, at Duquesne University School of Law, and send me an email. I'd be very receptive to responding to anything you might ask. Um, I'm getting some audio through. I might have to stand up to look. Uh oh. <laughs> well, I know that's my colleague <laughs> ragging on the pens. So we have to watch, Chris, that our, our friend Matt at the other end is, uh, is uh, from Philadelphia, so we want to be sensitive to. His flyer is not making it that far. Sorry about it. Eventually. Eventually. So I'm guessing, again, I'm getting some feedback, but Matt, I'm guessing there are no questions. And if there are, um, you know, if you would please be so kind as to. Can we see the videos on? Can we see the videos? Uh, there. On the web, that was a part of it we kind of skimmed over. Uh, if people send me an email, I could uh, show you some of the videos, certainly. Uh, the issue with playing videos through the web, uh, this go-to meeting, a webinar environment, is that my experience is they never really work. That's why we're hoping to show them on the local computer there in the room where uh, all of the attendees are. If I play them at my end, they just, because of the frame rate sampling and things, uh, it doesn't quite work over the webinar. But I'd be willing to try. If you send, if you send even me. Oh, sorry? It's on his end. It's, I think it's his speaker. All right, well, uh, again, 
thank you all for attending the session. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the conference. Enjoy Atlanta. It's a lot of fun. And uh, thank you particularly, Matt, for all of your help. You've been absolutely wonderful to work with over the last few days. Thank you all. Have a good conference. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Who do we have next? <laughs> okay. So, who was the next person up on the list to present? guy over here. Okay. It's not my dog, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a beautiful dog though, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we like you so much better because Let's see if I can. So, uh, folks, many of the folks who came before have, have um, invoked themes similar to, to uh, the ones that I will uh, discuss. Um, I think my take might be a little different from those who teach legal writing um, and, uh, and folks who focus on, on helping students and faculty um, use the library. And part of it is cultural, I think, at least um, in the law schools where I've taught. Um, there's been a lot of resistance by doctrinal faculty um, to using technology. And I was one of the big resistors, I must say, for, um, for a large part of my teaching career. Um, so I teach criminal law. Um, in, our, in our school, it's first semester of the first year, uh, and it's a required course. It's a four-hour required course. And like uh, most folks who um, teach such courses, um, and well, let me talk about criminal law in particular, I um, go through pretty much the standard uh, list of, of, of subjects in terms of content. So I teach uh, the justification of punishment, um, the elements of criminal liability in the abstract, sort of mens rea and actus reus. I go through um, a couple of crimes that have been kind of drivers of the uh, development of the criminal law, homicide being an obvious one, sexual assault. Um, I, I uh, talk about uh, inchoate liability, attempt and accomplice liability, and so forth, and, uh, and then I do the affirmative defenses. So, um, pretty standard lineup. Um, and for most of my career, I, I uh, taught these courses using a very standard textbook, which I, I still love, Kadish and Chilhoff, are a very intellectually rich uh, textbook. Um, but one that focuses on um, getting the students to read cases um, in the textbook and then discussing and analyzing them in class. So about nine or ten years ago, I decided that I wanted to have some way of assessing how the students were doing in the middle of the semester, and I started giving a midterm. Um, and I did it uh, for credit, and I did it for not for credit, both, both ways. Um, and I discovered um, in reading the answers, the students' answers to the questions, um, that many of them um, were, or some of them at least, were uh, a lot more lost on some of the basic things that we'd done, it seemed to me, even in the first two or three weeks of the course than I had realized. Um, and that started me reading a little bit in the, uh, li the literature of teaching and, and education and how people learn. And 
Um, and I began to think more about how I was structuring the class. I, I'd done, in addition to teaching the traditional uh, content of criminal law, I'd, I'd always done the final exam. That was the, the, uh, the single um, assessment method in, in the course. And then, of course, I'd meet with the students and so forth. And I started, um, it, the more I read in the education literature, the more it seemed to me that, um, that at least for my class, um, I might want to move more toward more assessments um, and more um, opportunities to interact with the students. Uh, to many of you, this may seem very elementary, but, uh, but to me, uh, nine or 10 years ago, this was like breaking new ground. So, um, and then as, as I thought more about it, it seemed to me that I, it was very important to me to keep the, the core content of, in the classroom um, aligned with what the way I'd always taught it. That is, analyzing the, the legal issues, um, discussing the cases, uh, and um, and thinking through the problems and the different approaches to uh, the the core issues, like mens rea and actus reus, um, uh, gave rise to in the courtroom. Right. So I wanted to keep that in terms of teaching the content, and and as I kept thinking about it, it seemed to me that maybe oh, the way to go was to um, was to begin thinking about using technology to help structure the course and help. Um, bring, help give me the tools to, um, to do in-class assessment right then um, with the students um, and, uh, and then also to begin, as I was saying before, looking for methods to do more graded assessments than just the final exam um, as we went through the semester. So this distinction between structural and substantive isn't a really strong one, but I, I like thinking of it that way um, it, because it, it suggests, to me at least, um, that I can keep the, the sort of core analytical discussions in class the same, uh, pretty much the same, uh, although they've changed to some degree, and, um, and use technology to, uh, to accomplish some, uh, some st more structural goals, to give the feedback to um, one goal that, um, that my students had talked about uh, and that I've since read in the literature um, that hasn't been really native to, uh, to law teaching, I don't think, is to find ways to encourage the students to work as teams and to do problems as teams. In the traditional 1L doctrinal class, at least, they don't have much of a chance to do that. So I wanted to think about doing that more. I think the students teach each other a lot. They, don't, they never believe that when I tell them that. They always want to, to you know, hear what I have to say. Um, and so dividing them into working groups, which I've done for a long time, and having them do problems um, and then use technology in ways I'll talk about in a minute um, to do those problems has um, it really brings home to them that, uh, that they really do teach each other a lot and, um, and can produce uh, good work as, as a group. Then a third thing I wanted to do is to be able to tell in class, I can, you can sometimes feel in class that people are confused, it's hard to get at that, um, find ways to figure out what's going on um, in, in with respect to issues that, that typically confuse the students um, and to use technology to do that. And then finally, um, it's a little bit of a cliche, but, but to make, to uh, somehow make some of these very abstract ideas like um, mens rea and mental culpability seem, um, seem alive in the classroom. So those are my four goals in using technology. And this is really a very personal story of how I um, evolved from someone who didn't use any um, high tech, not even PowerPoint, um, for most of my career to, uh, to uh, a more um, tech, a tech-friendly um, professor. So first, uh, I moved to PowerPoint, uh, discovering that it was somewhat more uh, challenging to do that um, than, uh, than I had imagined before. I, so writing a slide, here's one of my first ones in 2007, uh, that isn't wordy um, and uh, is, is, at least for me, has been, has been a challenge. Um, and I, I quickly discovered that when I you write slides like this, instead of bringing the students in with you, you lose them immediately, right? Because the minute the words are up there, what they're focused on doing is reading those words. Um, and so uh, I, I had to really, um, really work with that. Nonetheless, I do think PowerPoint is a fantastic tool in the doctrinal the criminal law classroom, um, uh, if you can solve that problem, which I've really worked on doing. Um, I think uh, for, for it, it helps focus the students, um, and uh, and you can introduce general topics, which you then um, branch off of in, in the more traditional uh, discussion-oriented way, um, and uh, and I. 
I've had a, a, a debate with colleagues and myself over the question of posting the slides on my law, right? Um, I, I don't do that typically. Uh, the students uh, typically want us to. Uh, I don't, I, but for some populations of students, for example, I've just been reading about some of the challenges that students for whom English is not their primary language face in the classroom. And, um, and there's some uh, indication that just merely posting slides or sending the slides to them can really help them track the material in a way that, uh, that other students can't. So many, we have a fairly large LLM program at our law school, and I know many others do these days too. Um, and, uh, and so, and most of them are students for whom English is not their native language, um, and uh, mm -hmm. and it, it, they have expressed, you know, a great appreciation just to have the slides. I've also occasionally done narrated PowerPoints for uh, for the students generally. So I'll do a weekly summation, in which I use some slides um, and to give the student. And I've posted this on our system. Uh, we use MyLaw. I don't know if anyone uh, else uses that. We did use Blackboard, and we switched to MyLaw. Um, and uh, and that also is, is a, has been proven a good uh, a good weekly review for uh, for the students. Um, I have sometimes divided the class into working groups. Um, I, I divide the class into working groups for the whole semester, but I've sometimes had the class use PowerPoint as working groups. Um, and they, for example, uh, I'll give them a problem and then ask each group to do a PowerPoint slide um, as their answer. And then I'll pick three or four of them and, um, and show them to the class. And we'll talk about the strengths and, um, and weaknesses of them. Ultimately, uh, though, that wasn't really enough, uh, using PowerPoint is what I'm saying, even though I, I, I do think that it, it's very helpful. Um, because I wanted more of, uh, again, this assessment piece um, doesn't really happen with, uh, with PowerPoint. How do you assess what's going on in class? So I moved to Poll Everywhere. Some of you may have uh, used Poll Everywhere. It used to be a clicker system, right? I'm sure, I don't know if you used it at that point. Now um, the students can use it just with their laptops or, or their phones and, and text you the answer to questions. So you can, this is not a crim law question. I took this from somewhere else. But um, you can instantly discover um, how, how well the students are tracking on, uh, um, on an issue. And they uh, can answer anonymously so that there's no risk to them in raising their hand and, um, and asking a question. In addition, um, the, you, you can on, work. You can on Poll Everywhere do surveys, so essentially quizzes um, consisting of multiple questions. Um, and you can have the students either individually or as working groups um, answer these questions and each one turns out to be a poll. So they can do this as groups um, outside of class and then come in and you can look at the results and then pick out the questions that, um, that were most troubling for the students and, uh, and uh, go over those more in class. And you can ask questions that are the base, you know, ask for their opinions as the basis for a subsequent discussion or you can ask pretty specific doctrinal questions um, and, um, and ask them to, to respond. And you can do multiple choice, uh, true or false, um, however many uh, answer possibilities you want. So I, I've been using poll everywhere for that. Um, in my own evolution, that still wasn't enough because I wanted a, a way of um, of being able to track each student through the semester. So in other words, for, for with Poll Everywhere surveys, you can, you can get a pretty good idea of how the class as a group is, um, is tracking on a question. But, but at least at that point, I've heard that they've, um, they've uh, evolved some since, but, um, but at least at that point, uh, you, couldn't, uh, you couldn't track each student's answer to a question and, um, and assess how they were doing. So I, as of last year, I, I uh, tried using Blackboard um, for, is this even here? Maybe it is. Uh, somehow I lost it. Oh, no, here it is. Uh, and I devised quizzes um, for them, uh, an average of one per week. And, uh, and uh, they would take them online. A couple of other speakers have talked about this this afternoon. Um, they would take the quiz online, and the program would grade the quiz and keep track of their grade. So I can go in um, at any point in the semester and, and see, wow, this student has a 60 average on the quizzes. I think I need to maybe approach them and, uh, and see if we can um, have follow-up meetings. Um, and uh, and maybe, maybe there's a problem. Um, 
And that has been, and, and I could, I also use these for group projects. So the working groups uh, will, will do, some of these were working group quizzes and some were individual quizzes. The students can take the quizzes after doing the reading. I can make them reading focused or I can ask a more general problem um, that, that at the end of a particular section and have them work on those. So this was a big advance forward for me um, in terms of my original goal of, of uh, being able to assess them. Still, um, Blackboard, at least for me, was very clunky in class. And um, even here, with, your, with the excellent video uh, facilities, you can see uh, uh, the, the students were unable in our classrooms to, um, to see the questions uh, if I put them up on, on the board. So, um, and what I really wanted, I discovered, was a combination of the, ability, the Blackboard type ability to, uh, to assess the students and know which, uh, what each one of them was doing, and the poll everywhere uh, type of capability, sort of look at the quiz after the deadline had passed for taking it, and then come back to class and have the poll everywhere type of, um, of graphs um, to show them in class as we talked about the, um, the different problems. So be able to come back and say, okay, question three and question six, clearly there, there are some issues here. Here was the class's response. Let's go back over that um, and, uh, and figure out what, what may have been um, going on and why people, uh, so why so many folks, for example, uh, did not get the right answer. Um, so that was, and, and Blackboard couldn't offer that. You had to do it separately. Um, and. And in other ways, it was, it was kind of clunky. It would, it would assess your questions, and some of the questions it told me were easy, I thought were pretty tough, and, some, and, and, uh, and vice versa. Um, and there were, there were a lot of settings on Blackboard uh, for each quiz to pick, and I hadn't had a course in Blackboard at all, so, um, so it, was, it was kind of an invitation to make major mistakes, and I made them, um, so especially, especially in the beginning of the, of the semester. Most recently, um, what I've moved toward is talking to some uh, to a uh, couple of the textbook companies. Uh, let's see if did I. Oops, um, this seems to have disappeared. Uh, let's see if I can get it back. <laughs> um, but I've but I, w I wanted to show you a uh, an electronic. Um, version of a textbook that I've been considering for crim law. Let's see if it'll. No, I don't know what it's doing. It, the, so. Okay, and I was having trouble getting uh, getting internet service. So, but long story short, um, I, I've been going the electronic textbook way, which which. Um, Includes not only um, the the basic doctrinal coverage, but uh, but uh, links to definitions of words and, and legal terms, and um, and built-in assessments that can be done individually or as groups for the students, and then I can then read and assess. Um, the, the problems I've run into so far with that are that uh, often the textbooks, at least the ones that I've seen, don't contain cases. So I would have to do a compilation of cases separately and then a separate set of quizzes to test the students on those cases. And, um, and that a, a couple of the times, uh, of one, one, one thing they do that I really liked the idea of was embed videos. Uh, for students who learn orally more, uh, they would embed short videos about main concepts. I've noticed a number of pretty important doctrinal mistakes in those, though. So, um, so I, there are at least uh, some of them. It seems are not ready for prime time. So, uh, so that's where I am right now. And uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions or suggestions. But this is a, a really an ongoing project um, for me. Yes. Uh, so Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, I think I thought it was the the uh, electronic textbook method, but at least the ones I've seen are not up there. Um, they they're kind of marketed to a range of classes, and for the but for the straight doctrinal criminal law, where you know. 
I'm really particular about about uh, about analytical analytical exactness. They're not there yet. So I think we're, what I probably will do is um, is look for another. Oh, well, it, one thing I'm going to do is go back to Poll Everywhere, which tells me that they have worked on a quiz system that. Um, will allow you to track back and follow each individual student. Um, and if I can do that and send out the surveys, which uh, either individually or as groups um, that I design to the students, then that would allow me to do the individual quizzing and follow them and come back the next day and show them the graph and say, OK, question three was really troubling to a lot of people here. Um, so that's uh, number one. If not, I'm going to try to find some other, uh, some non-Blackboard uh, um, vehicle in which to do all those things. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but just use a Facebook group page, and and you can actually utilize it like an LMS system. Documents, etc. So this might answer your question too. It might be a way of going, right? And uh, I'm so sorry I won't be here on Saturday, but I will look forward to watching uh, that that presentation. Um, and I think the main point you're making is such a good one because the faculty, faculty, at least at my school, are confused. There are some faculty, for example, uh, who think that multitasking is a terrible thing. And, and you know, drawing on our own education, right, where we want the students to focus, it makes sense. That's what I thought. Um, and uh, and don't allow laptops at all in the classroom. They make the they're, students they're handwrite their notes. Yeah. Yeah. Not a good thing. I've seen different literature saying that the students look talking about yeah, learning differently can do that these course, days. But yeah. Everything I read it goes more towards the fact that it's not the thing to do. But yeah. You have to kind of balance it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree with that, and like, yeah, like yeah. Like the companies are all doing practice online, but the MBEs will sit down and bubble in. If they can't bubble in, they're going to fail the class. I don't care if they prefer to do it at home on a screen, but that's not what they have to do. That's true, and I think the students are even mixed in their abilities these days, um, which may be connected to what you're, you're saying. Um, I find that, for example, in a lot of ways, they're very tech savvy, and I, and I know I have to uh, uh, stop here, but but in other ways, not. I mean, I've had good luck uh, with them with PowerPoint, um, but when I tried to have them do videos and negotiation um, and, and show them in class, that freaked them out, right? Well, actually, so, um, yeah. People, the answers are probably better with the tech than the millennials. Part of their life, they don't think about it, have to use it, whatever. Yeah. So they may be very tech savvy that they can use it all, but do they understand it all? And if it's new to them, can they do any of the best with it? Is even it even maybe it's just law students, but um, but even using it uh, sometimes oh, is so. is uh, is sometimes a problem. But anyway, thank you all. And, uh,
Very helpful. Do you like your laptop back? It'll take a second to, to set up anyway. So, excellent. Thank you. I'll do my best. <laughs> Okay. Hi. So it was really nice to actually uh, have a few people come, you know, present before me. Um, it's good to see you all. It's my first time at CaliCon, and up to about an hour ago, I wasn't even here. I'd been traveling for 36 hours from California. So if I'm a little, little out of it, you know, but it, it means that I'm very, very grateful to be in Atlanta. It took a very long time to get here. <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to come here because of something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, so, you want, so you know, I am a, uh, a very recent law graduate. Uh, graduated from UC Davis 2015, a uh, librarian before that, going into law librarianship. And even before that, I used to work as a massage therapist. And it was very interesting to me to go to UC Davis, which is, I think, one of the schools that is really embraced the concept of, of mindfulness as a tool for students, um, looking into what uh, legal practitioners are looking for um, in terms of, of practice. And I'd say, you know, 15 years ago, if you wanted to have a mindfulness class in a law school, that probably would have been considered kind of strange. And at this point, it's starting to steamroll and it's becoming some of the most popular things that some of the most popular courses, at least at Davis and some other schools, that's, that's brought it on. I mean, there's a small number of people in the room, but for your institutions, how many of you have something that is specifically called mindfulness or a mindfulness uh, student group or anything like that? What about classes about burnout, about being able to handle um, what's going to happen with your career, to be able to actually plan out what the next five years are going to be like? what the next 10 years are going to be like, what the next 15 years are going to be like. Um, yeah, well, you know, this is the thing. It's in some places and others. In California, I'm in Northern California. Uh, Cal and Davis has this all the time. Um, but here's the, here's the thing. I really think it's spreading. It's, the interest in it is waxing. And I think that it is a good idea to be aware of what's going on but also to think about, I mean, my whole goal for bringing this here is that I'm really hoping that we in the library fields and the information fields, we can both contribute to the discussion of what mindfulness should be in the, in the legal field and if, you know, that we can contribute our um, life experiences and our legal skills to this. But I also want to remind people that when we're looking at what we want to teach when it comes to life skills and legal skills, that these things can dovetail with what people who are trying to teach mindfulness are teaching. And so if that interest comes to your school, you might be prepared to be able to use that to your advantage. This is often what it tends to look like in a mindfulness class, actually. One of the reasons that I wanted to bring it here to a tech room um, is that oftentimes when um, People talk about teaching mindfully, they think about getting rid of tech. And I will talk about that in a little bit, but first I just want to introduce what mindfulness is. I could spend a lot of time talking about it, but I'd rather talk about what we can do with it. Um, it often ends up getting, getting shortened in, um, in um, journals to essentially be the non-judgmental awareness of the present moment. And this can mean a whole lot of things. But the way that you can interpret it is very wide. Um, it can be 
something you know as easy as you know I'm going to start meditating and pay attention to where I am in this room um, or it can go to some really far interesting places um, it's important to me to actually be able to to see a wide variety of, of takes on it come out and not have everyone assume that it's going to be let's say um, neuro-linguistic programming which we actually did have a speaker come in and she was a, a coach for lawyers and she came in talking about neuro-linguistic programming and I encourage you to look it up sometime it encourages being able to touch someone and encourage them to feel that feeling again if you ever touch them again in that way it is entirely debunked, <laughs> but you have this stuff coming in. Um, well, anyway, it brings me to the question of why is mindfulness popular? And honestly, law school is kind of uh, a face plant. You're tied to your work. Um, it's you want to f find a way out of it, and this is, you want to find a way to make, make it feel like you can do this, like things will work, that you can have control over your surroundings. And mindfulness, at the very least in popular culture, when you're seeing it you know, written, written about, people are talking about it in this, well, it will solve this and it will solve that. And whether or not that's true, we certainly have an interest in it. And we certainly have studies, certainly law students have been talking about the benefits that they get in their practice. Um, legal professionals have been too. Um, but so just so you understand, at least at Davis, um, our mindfulness class is probably one of the two most popular classes. Um, we have a wine law class which people take because it's wine. Everyone loves that. Um, but for mindfulness, you'd think that it's like, you know, this is going to be an easy A, but when you talk to people, it's actually a great deal of people who are going into um, big firm law who are concerned about how they're going to be able to keep up the frenetic pace that they've been keeping in law school that they see themselves going into. And it is one of our most popular classes. It is a seminar of 54 people at this point, and it almost invariably has the entire 3L class try to get in <laughs> um, because it's seen as an actual life skill that's going to continue on. And so the way that it ends up getting broken down into, into in law schools, I think, um, tends to be broken down into three parts. One is the personal mindfulness part, where you're talking about meditation, yoga, the idea of, of being in the moment for yourself, how it benefits you. It includes career, uh, figuring out where your career is going, figuring out how to avoid burnout, that kind of thing. Um, there's also um, sort of an interpersonal professional mindfulness concept where it goes into lawyering skills. So, for instance, there are courses that teach cross-examination from a mindfulness perspective, where you have to listen, the way that you listen to other people, um, you, you learn various skills, like let's say you're doing cross-examination, to get used to the way that uh, speaking might work, you might toss a tennis ball back and forth um, in order to get the natural gaps in conversation, as in actually have a, having a conversation. Um, and then we also have something sort of institutional mindfulness, where people are learning about, say, um, social justice movements, or looking at the broader picture in law, you know, looking at adversarial systems, considering what, you know, where we might go with this, and bringing mindfulness in there. And so it was here when I was listening to the institutional mindfulness stuff where someone was, we had someone come in talking about, um, in social justice movements that one of the things they really were trying to figure out in mindfulness was looking at the bigger picture. That it was so easy to focus on the small thing in the middle that everything else just sort of blacks out. Kind of like a railroad going through. Um, that you're on that path and there's all these things and you sort of imagine there's something bigger and creative there but you're just 
so strapped for time that you're continuously going forward. And then I was remembering that, you know, what this person was talking about was actually kind of just systems analysis, but that no one in the room seemed to really be familiar with the concept of systems analysis. Um, the idea that, um, I mean, for me as a librarian, the way it was introduced to me was having a systems librarian come in um, to install a security system. And then coming in and realizing, wait, the books are disappearing because of our circulation, um, our circulation policy. If we change our circulation policy, we don't need to install the $10,000 security system. Um, but it made me realize that I came into this class as a, as a massage therapist going in. I wasn't really thinking about where my tech interest would go, where my library interest would go. And then I realized that we have a lot in common. It's an incredibly interdisciplinary topic and it's something that we can use. Um, so from there, I was trying to think of just some ways to, to do that. And what I'm hoping this does is not, you know, just here's some ways, go bring it out, but to encourage you all to just think a little bit about if it comes to you, if the mindfulness idea comes to you, how can you contribute? Um, so for me, one of the things that I thought about from a library perspective is uh, students forming research queries. That students, at least at my school, had a sort of neutral to negative idea of how their, their research skills were. They really hated it. Um, it always just took a lot of time. And law school feels like this. You're just constantly, you know, practicing law looks that way. And it's hard to keep going forward. You just have these deadlines. You're just constantly, you know, you're given a question and you have to answer it in 20 minutes. And it just feels like it's that over and over and over again. So, why not go to the one thing that you've known forever, you know, the one um, search box, as opposed to trying to go to the library webpage and find the right database, things like that. It takes time. As law students, we don't feel like we have that time. And when we're in the workplace, we're not being asked in a way to be able to take the time to actually think about these, these questions. But at least as librarians know, you need, if you're just constantly, you know, questioning something and querying and not actually planning out your search, it's never going to end. It doesn't take, it, it feels like it takes less time because each, you know, single search is quick. But there's no plan. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's Google or if it's CEB. You just go in for that one single search box and go at it. Um, but there's a benefit to being able to think about, um, you know, to take the part the question, to see the words in it, to be able to see, okay, what are our synonyms for these words, go through the index, figure out what it is, plan out the search, and do it from there. And that's where I think a personal mindfulness concept would come in, um, where Students are interested in mindfulness. They don't want to burn out. If students are currently hearing us talk about how to form a query, and they just say, eh, I know how to do it, it's fine, but they feel like they want to learn mindfulness, you can bring in the concept of, well, you're supposed to you know, at least think you're in the present moment. Consider what's going on around you as opposed to just going forward and trying to push this. Um, it's actually. Uh, a mathematician at Cal actually did a metacognition uh, study with um, professors of math and uh, undergrads trying to approach a math problem for the first time. And they found that the undergrads generally would look at it, didn't spend a lot of time parsing it, parsing it and would just immediately start trying to work it out. Um, whereas the more experienced math professors or something that is equally as baffling to them would, would stop and they would analyze the question. They would analyze the question, they'd plan out their attack, and then they'd implement it. And it takes less time overall to do this, but it's hard to encourage students to be able to think about it from this way 
And so hopefully bringing in some of their interest in mindfulness would work there. Um, so one of the other things that I was thinking about was from the interpersonal mindfulness issue. And it goes with what um, you were talking about, I think, with multitasking and um, social media. It's kind of a topic that I think has been talked about to death in a lot of ways. But I think it's, it's good to revisit. Um, just as another concept of how to think about mindfulness in the classroom. Um, I don't know how many of you, there's so many studies on how multitasking is helpful, not helpful. One of my favorites is one that came out in 2013 that talked about how um, multitasking was actually more detrimental to the people around the people multitasking than to the people multitasking themselves. Um, that just being able to have it in your periphery was distracting. And at least when you were doing the multitasking, you could stop when something important to you happened in the lecture. And so you could do that multitasking. And this is this is speculation, what I'm just saying from the from the from the study, trying to understand the results. Whereas when you're just sitting next to someone who's multitasking, um, if they are if they're doing anything else, if they are playing a video game and they're in the middle of the boss, which happened to me a few times in Fed Tax, um, sitting behind someone who's doing this, it's kind of difficult to continue to pay attention even when you are actively trying to block out the other distractions. And you know, the way that I think a lot of professors try to deal with this is by just totally getting rid of tech. Um, by saying, okay, let's not have a laptop here. I won't have the PowerPoint. You, you know, we'll use notebooks, that'll be fine. Um, I, it works in some ways, but I think that really to be mindful, one of the things we want to do is actually think about what we're trying to accomplish. Just getting rid of it, it's, it's an easy fix, but there might be other benefits that we could get from, from laptops, from laptop usage in the classroom that you lose just from banning it. Um, there's you know, some evidence that um, some of the you know, top students um, you know, have heavy computer usage. And some of the things that you might do is, it's been suggested you know, going and talking to your class ahead of time, setting ground rules about what you can do, um, about what, how, what people will do. You, know, you will try not to multitask, you'll try not to do these things, and have everyone actively agree to it rather than just having it in the syllabus. Um, discuss it with people and, and make sure that they agree. Um, but then I think tech could help with this kind of concept as well. That, um, that there's a few things that I've seen out there which I think make some sense, but I think we could do better. Uh, there's a number of programs, for instance, first of all, like you'd always just turn off your internet and just use your laptop. There's also programs which will uh, not let you use Facebook or anything else that you could ask someone to use. But from my perspective, you have students who they might want to not multitask, but they still have, you know, they're still occasionally they're going to want to do things. And just having it totally blocked is going to have them just hate the system and be distracted by the system themselves. Um, we could think about ways just to sort of gently nudge people if they are multitasking when they have chosen not to do this. Um, just having some kind of, you know, you have like a little flicker of light on the you know, left corner of the screen as you're doing it, just as a reminder, you have stopped doing, you know, full notes, you're on Facebook, why don't you come back to us? Um, and I think that we're starting to go that way. I don't know if anyone has seen this book yet by David Levy, it was published this year, Mindful Tech. Um, it's a pretty, it, I, I enjoyed the book. It is meant for personal use. Um, he's a um, professor at the iSchool at the University of Washington. And what he suggests is um, actually observing your own multitasking. Um, that you can have a video that's going to, just, just have a video go about what you do, and then review it afterward. And 
you might be able to notice the things that you choose to do, the things you didn't realize you were doing, the triggers that cause you to do these things. And then from there, you might consider how to think about where your focus is, is going and come up with a more healthy form of uh, multitasking if that is what you want to do. Um, I think that you could probably just read the book, but I highly, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, certainly gives some ideas for um, some mindful tech, for, for mindful tech. And I would encourage this for students and for encouraging students to think about their practices and what's good for them. Um, so for there, I just wanted to bring in a couple ideas that I had just to, to get the ball rolling, but really, what I'm hoping that you all do when you come back to your, insti you know, your institutions is just think about what you do and what you want to give to students and how their interest in mindfulness might help you reach that goal. Um, does anyone want to talk about anything? Any questions? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, there's been there's been a number of them, yeah. um, and actually, um, yeah. If if you want, I can send you. There's even a few um, uh, law journals that have just just people talking about the courses they have taught in mindfulness. It goes from cross examination techniques and skills to the one that I took at Davis, which was a three part course. Um, Angela Harris teaches it, and uh, she does break it up into those three concepts, where she spends the first third talking about here are self care techniques. Um, while also trying to get people to think about why they came to law school in the first place. And this is a class for credit? Oh yes, okay. absolutely. Because we spend a lot of time, we end up spending a lot of time on skills and we bring in a lot of speakers. I brought up one speaker who was a new speaker that didn't work out very well, but on the whole we have people who are doing fantastic legal work out there. Many of other, our other professors come in and talk about how uh, mindfulness has impacted um, their work before coming to the law school, things like that. Um, how mindfulness helps you if you're working for Amnesty International and you're seeing atrocities every day, how do you keep going through with what you're doing? Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. 